you come upon the spring, the first thing you notice is the trees. Kita Bikita Springs is an oasis, one of the rare sources of water in the middle of the Sonoran Desert. The springs have provided water for animals in a region where it's hard to come by. And for the past 12,000 or so years, people have also used Kita Bikita as a place to trade, to grow and harvest food, and to rest while traveling. It has always been a place of refuge, a place of survival for anybody and anything that's ever crossed through that territory. In the 1900s, the springs and the surrounding area were selected by the U.S. government for conservation and given one of the highest levels of environmental protection in the world. But those protections launched a chain of events, starting with the removal of the indigenous peoples who had been there for generations. Around the world, in the face of biodiversity loss and the climate crisis, there are calls to expand protected areas. But a simple designation doesn't guarantee protection. Today, these sacred springs are drying up. So what went wrong at Quito Piquito? How does this look different from how you might remember? Barren, very barren, very barren. You can see the water's gone down again, so I don't know. Lorraine Eiler is from the Hiached Autumn tribe, and her family has lived by the springs for generations. Many of her relatives are buried there. If you do research on Kita Bikita, the majority of times you will read about the cattlemen that lived here in the area, about the people that went through Kita Bikita. You hear nothing about the fact that it's an old Indian village. It was abundance. And so it was a very vibrant place at one time. Um, now it's just, um, well, you see what it looks like. Quito Piquito Springs is part of the Autumn people's traditional homelands, especially the Tohono and Hiached Autumn nations. But before it was part of a national park, before Arizona became a state in 1912, and even before there was an international border, the springs were really more like a marsh. Water flowed into the wetlands, feeding the gardens of squash, corn, and melons in the middle of the desert. And it's still a sacred place to the autumn people now. Well, we believe that this is a, it's a living entity, that it also has its, its spirit. It's hard to describe or get people to understand unless they feel it for themselves. I hope that I'm saying this without playing into the romanticization of Native peoples. It does exist. It just doesn't look like how people portray it in the media. We're desert people. You know, we have to, we have to take care of all these things that make us who we are. Settlers, warfare, and political decisions in the 1800s dispossessed the autumn of their lands and carved the region into pieces. First, the U.S.-Mexico border split autumn communities separating families and cutting people off from their lands. Decades later, the U.S. government seized autumn lands by congressional act and, without a treaty, pushed the Tohono Autumn onto a reservation. On the newly claimed land surrounding Quito Piquito Springs, Franklin Roosevelt created Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in 1937. In the early days of the National Park Service, parks were mostly created with entertainment, sightseeing, and aesthetic beauty in mind. The agency believed that these areas should be kept wild, protecting nature from human interference. But what they missed was that places like Quito Bikito were already a product of thousands of years of human maintenance, and that the park still had people in it. The Orozcos, a Hiached Autumn family, were living in Quito Bikito Springs when the park was created. They stayed in the area long after many tribal members were pushed out. The family's animals, buildings, and machinery didn't match the agency's vision of a wild, people-less park. So finally, after decades of pressure, the National Parks purchased the land for $13,000, bulldozed the Orozcos' home, dug out a bigger collecting pond for water from the spring, and built a parking lot nearby to attract visitors. There was this idea that you would take the people out of living in these protected spaces, but they could come and they could visit and they could enjoy the natural environment. And we would protect that environment up to an extent. But indigenous presence is vital to the stewardship of the land. 
Without livestock to graze by the water's edge, bulrushes invaded the pond, decreasing water flow. The decrease in water flow led to sediment buildup, and in 1962, that increased sediment prompted park officials to dredge the pond. But that made the water too deep and cold for the snowy to pupfish, one of the two endangered species endemic to the area, and that forced Park Service to build a kind of shelf in the pond so the fish could live in warmer waters. At the same time, the nearby parking lot meant visitors had easy access to the water. And one park visitor released a golden shiner into the pond, a fish so adept to the springs, it started out competing the pupfish and driving it towards extinction. Once park officials realized this, to get rid of the golden shiners, they removed the pupfish, poisoned the pond, refilled it, and then put the pupfish back. Today, this protected area is drying out. The 90s saw a long-term drought in the region, and water levels plummeted. Just generally speaking, this, this spring has been um, producing less and less and less every decade for the last several decades, substantially less, from yeah. 30 gallons a minute to 20 to 10, now less than 10 gallons per minute. It, it is a trend across the West, for sure. And hotter and drier. I mean, what are, the, the park is getting hotter and drier by, by any measure. The decline of the springs has been attributed to drought and climate change and the expansion of nearby farming that taps into the natural underground aquifers. And then the border wall came. Construction on the U.S. president's border wall with Mexico is moving ahead. Rules protecting historical and cultural sites were waived. The nine-meter-tall metal structure will require new roads bulldozed through the monument and the adjacent Tohono O'odham Reservation. In 2020, the U.S. government built a wall, 30 feet high, that cut across the entire southern edge of the park. Crews drilled for groundwater near the declining springs that they then used to make cement. During that period of time, the water level started going down and um, the pond itself, right in the center, was just uh, became dry. It's not entirely clear whether border wall construction caused water levels to drop. And we might never know because the Trump administration waived all environmental assessments in the name of national security. The United States has some of the best environmental laws of any nation in the world, but on the border, the fact of national security preempted the application of those laws. So they basically said that the environmental laws are not going to apply in the same way. Now that's catastrophic for a fragile conservation area. Drastic action had to be taken, or the pond would dry up. In 2022, the Park Service relined the pond with support from a nonprofit that Lorraine works with, the International Sonoran Desert Alliance. People from U.S. government agencies and the Tohono O'odham Nation worked to delicately scoop the turtles and pupfish into holding tanks until the lining was replaced and the pond was refilled. But restoration is ongoing. And it's not yet clear whether or not these efforts will restore water levels or how long that fix will last. Whatever was here is gone. We'll never, we'll never get to the point of what it used to look like. We have enough water that it starts going out into the area, then we can start replanting. So while we will never have what we had before here, we'll have some semblance of it. And it all depends on water, if we have enough water. Quito Paquito Springs is just very fragile and very beautiful and draws tourists from all over and it has a wonderful backstory. And I think a lot of the border violence, a lot of the impacts on Tana Atam, those are invisible when you're visiting that place. And that cultural landscape is part of the environmental landscape and we need to steward that and protect it and care for it just as we do those endangered species.